Montague's finest hour. Paddington Station is the main terminus in London for the Great Western Railway. It is a busy and bustling place. Hundreds of trains heading and arriving from the West Country are always kept to a strict time regime. No engine feels this responsibility more deeply than the station pilot, Montague. Montague is a pannier tank and very proud of being Great Western. There are two ways of doing things, he told the other engines. The Great Western way or the wrong way. I'm Great Western and so are we, they would groan. No matter how much Montague's insistent reminders of the Great Western would annoy the other engines, they couldn't fault his enthusiasm and determination. They all understood it took a strong-willed engine to cope with the huge demand expected of station pilot. One engine that didn't think much of Montague's duty was Alexander, a large prairie tank. He thought shunting coaches wasn't a very strenuous job at all. It's just a job for lazy tank engines, Alexander scorned. Nothing to it at all. Montague was very cross. I do more work than you will ever know. Just you wait, Alexander. I'll show you how hard my work is. Alexander thought nothing of it and sniffed importantly away. Britain was beginning to become apprehensive and nervous. News of a powerful and formidable force was sweeping through Europe. The engines had heard that Germany was once again becoming a threat, but none of them thought otherwise. It had been 21 years since the end of the war to end all wars, and they thought that was that. None of the engines expected something that would have an even more devastating effect on their lives than the Great War previous. On September the 3rd, 1939, Britain was at war with Germany. Life on the railway seemed to change almost overnight. New rules were enforced immediately. Passengers were advised to only travel if strictly necessary and to use caution and vigilance at all times. Montague was ordered to shunt a long line of coaches into Platform 3. This didn't seem out of the ordinary. In fact, it was more of a familiar routine. But this was no ordinary passenger train. This is a troop train, Montague, explained the driver. The coaches will be packed with soldiers heading for France. As Montague watched the men say goodbye to their loved ones and boarded the train, he felt a twinge of sorrow and upset. My goodness, some of them are only boys, he whispered. The driver said no more. He could sense Montague growing increasingly agitated. Montague hurried away to fetch some more coaches, but he couldn't help but feel that this was one situation he wouldn't be able to run away from. Indeed, over time, the sight of troop trains departing became an everyday occurrence. Montague always knew the station was, at times, a place of sadness with the departure of loved ones, but not on a scale such as this. Some of these men would never return home. One day, Montague shunted another troop train. He had just come to a stop when the giant station roof was filled with the sounds of music. The driver and fireman looked back. Look at this, Montague, he cried. We're being invaded by the Scots. The sounds of bagpipes drowned out the trains as a Scottish regiment marched proudly down the platform. Montague watched with interest as the music played and they stood to attention next to him. When at last the music stopped and the men were able to say their goodbyes, some approached Montague. Hey, what's your name, laddie? asked a soldier. Montague, sir. Oh, that's a fancy name for a wee engine. I'm station pilot, huffed Montague, offended. And a grand job you do too, said another. But you didn't suit the name, Montague. Montague bit his tongue. You take care, laddie, and look after yourself. This war is going to be a rough one. 
Montague was uncoupled and made way for another engine to back onto the train. The soldiers said goodbye and boarded. Montague met many soldiers, some from all across the Commonwealth. He met soldiers from Canada, Australia and New Zealand. They all said the same thing. The war was going to affect the people of Britain. Montague grew worried and told the other engines. Alexander snorted loudly. We're an island. The war can't get us. We are perfectly safe. But why would they all say the same thing, argued Montague. There is a danger that we haven't foreseen. Like what? snapped Montague. You think they're going to be able to reach us from here? They did in the last war, murmured a voice. The engines looked. An old Dean's goods engine sidled into the yard. I was meant to be sent across to France, but that never came to fruition when the Zeppelins bombed, he explained. They'd fly silently across the channel, and undetected in the night, would drop bombs on us from above. The engines were shocked. They killed hundreds of people. We called them Devil's Angels. Aircraft have improved greatly over a short amount of time. Who's to say the Germans won't try it again? Finished the engine darkly. No more was said. Montague noticed that Alexander remained unusually quiet. Indeed, the old engine's words came true. Bombing raids would batter the capital. The engines would watch aghast as dogfights between British and German aircraft would fill the night sky. Smoke billowing from burning buildings and giant floodlights searched frantically, trying to spot enemy bombers. Everyone was very frightened and would stay huddled together in the sheds. The engines hoped a stray missile wouldn't come near them. Indeed, there were a few close calls. Montague felt most distraught. He was more worried about the people and engines that were still out there, who weren't as lucky as they were taking cover. The railways of Britain were becoming a main target. The enemy were determined to stop the flow of any sort of train to bring the country to its knees. Precautions were soon taken. Engine cabs were completely encased so the fire's light could not be seen in the night by the enemy. Carriage windows and stations were blacked out and crews were issued with gas masks so to keep the trains moving however deadly the situation may be. Despite all this, the bombs kept dropping. Montague wouldn't be beaten. He worked days without having a rest. He shunted countless trains. On some occasions, he had to double up certain passenger trains. The long line of coaches would have to be assisted out of the station. Montague could be seen straining himself to the limit to push the heavy train out of the station. Come on, come on, groaned Montague in agony. We must keep going, we must keep going. Montague would even be seen at night helping freight trains out of the yards escaping the relentless onslaught of the German bombers. The engines soon realised life was becoming an uphill struggle to survive. Whilst they were dirty, overworked and looking worn out, they knew they could eventually be repaired and should the worst happen, they could be rebuilt again. But a human life could not. It became apparent to evacuate as many children as possible from the cities and into the countryside. The railways cooperated by preparing as many evacuation trains as possible. Montague was already very exhausted when he was asked to shunt the coaches. I'll organise another engine to take your place after this, said the station master. You've worked very hard, but you need a rest. Montague yawned. <sighs> Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No, Montague. Thank you. The station master smiled and walked away. Alexander's coaches had been shunted, and Montague sidled sleepily into a siding. As the children made their tearful goodbyes to their mothers and boarded the train, the station master returned to Montague. I'm sorry to have to do this to you, old boy, but Alexander is trapped behind some broken points. Workmen have been sent to free him, but nothing can come out of the sheds. 
You'll have to take the evacuation train. But, sir, I'm exhausted. I wouldn't ask you if the circumstances were different, but this is of the greatest importance. Montague didn't need telling twice. He completely understood. He blinked a couple of times and his fireman rubbed his eyes for him. But quickly, and without a fuss, Montague was coupled in front of the train. The guard blew his whistle, and Montague steamed out of Paddington. Every open window was filled with waving children, trying to get that final glance of their families before they disappeared out of sight. As the train slithered over the points, Montague's heart suddenly dropped. It was the sound of air raid sirens. People cried in horror as their children had now become a sitting target. There was nothing they could do but flee to the air raid shelters. A small fleet of enemy aircraft flew over London. They broke off and began to attack industrial sites, the docks, warehouses, and the railway. Montague was more awake than ever before. Come on, Montague, cried his driver. We must get these children to safety. His regulator was thrown open and Montague responded with a will. Hurry, 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 exclaimed Montague to the coaches. As fast as we can, as fast as we can. The coaches glided behind Montague, but their exuberant escape did not go unnoticed. A Messerschmitt spotted his exhaust rocketing into the air. He began to give chase. Faster, Montague, faster, shouted the driver. Montague gave it everything he had, but he was no match for the Messerschmitt. It opened fire. Bullets hit the line side and the roofs of the coaches. Get down, children, shouted the guard as they sobbed and screamed. The aircraft flew overhead. Montague tore through the next station, his whistle screaming as he thundered through. I must go faster, I must! The Messerschmitt came racing down for a second attack. He's heading straight for us, yelled the fireman. I've had enough of this, snapped Montague. Quickly, he snorted out a great cloud of smoke. It bellowed into the air and shadowed the coaches. It blacked out the Messerschmitt's view. He fired, but missed, and flew past. Good thinking there, old boy, cheered the driver. There's a tunnel not too far ahead. We can hide in there. With Montague's power and high speed, the pannier tent was beginning to waddle and bounce around violently. Montague was worried he'd waddle himself right off the rails. The Messerschmitt was coming down for a third attempt. The tunnel came into view. We're going to make it, cried Montague. Sentries guarding the tunnel mouth opened fire on the aircraft. Montague gave it one last effort and ploughed into the safety of the tunnel. Then, with no time to lose, the driver slammed on the brakes. Montague screeched along the rails, sparks lighting up the darkness, until finally he stopped just before the tunnel exit. The plane rumbled overhead. It was followed immediately by another rumble from a squadron of Spitfires who sent the opposition packing. Montague gave a sigh of relief. He had done it. You brilliant engine, beamed the driver. I couldn't have asked anything better from any other engine. You flew along that line. You gave that Messerschmitt a run for its money. Oh, well, there are two ways of doing things, panted Montague. The Great Western way, or the wrong way. You truly are great, that's for sure, complimented the driver. The guard checked the children. Fortunately, none of them were hurt and some were none the worse for their adventure. When Montague returned to the sheds that night, he returned to a hero's welcome. The engines erupted into a chorus of whistles. The crews gave him three cheers and gave him a good rub down so his paintwork, brass and copper fittings shone victoriously in the evening light. Montague felt very proud. A few days later, Montague was preparing to leave the sheds, ready to return as station pilot, when the sentries that had been posted above the tunnel during the attack came to see him. We want to congratulate you on saving those children, said a soldier. 
"'You look splendid flying along the line, Duck,' said another. "'Well, I wasn't the one doing the flying, but what did you just call me?' asked Montague. "'Duck! It's the nickname the lads back at the base have given you. "'It's because you were waddling as you were running.' Montague thought for a moment and smiled. "'I quite like the name, Duck,' he said. "'Sounds much more down-to-earth than Montague.' The sentries grinned. "'Not that there's anything wrong with that name. "'We just think duck suits you more.' The pannier tank laughed and puffed away to the station. Alexander had been left in charge as station pilot and found it harder than he first thought. He didn't let on about it when duck steamed in. "'At last, Montague, you're here. "'There's empty stock that needs taking from Platform 4.' "'Call me Duck,' came the reply. What? You heard me. Duck. Duck? Whatever for? It will remind me of that day, said Duck proudly, and apparently I waddle. Alexander grinned knowingly, and from that day on Montague became known as Duck. From time to time the other engines would tease him about his name. His waddle became more noticeable than it ever was before, but Duck didn't care. His name may sound silly to others, but to those who understand, they will know it stands as a tribute to his finest hour.